Hey everybody, to kick it off, I wanted to do a quick lecture on what is a GIS. For those of you that haven't taken an introduction course to GIS prior, or maybe GIS is fairly new to you. So obviously you could go and Google what GIS is, but I wanted to take a couple minutes to walk through um, you know, what some of the really fundamental things are to understand some of the aspects and the components of a GIS are. So hopefully in about 20 minutes, we'll walk through this and you get a better understanding of what a GIS is. So what is a GIS? We've got a couple learning objectives for this lecture. First one, to understand what the parts of a GIS are. Understand the concept of layers in GIS. That's probably one of the most fundamental aspects of what a GIS is. And remember some of the common functions of GIS. I wanted to start by showing a great example of what a GIS is, or what an end product of a GIS can be. And this is a dashboard that was put together by Johns Hopkins University showing COVID cases and COVID deaths across the globe. And through this lecture, we're going to kind of uncover the reasons why this is a great example of what a GIS is and what a GIS has become today. So we'll revisit this at the end of the lecture, and hopefully it'll make a lot of sense of why this is a really great example. In terms of the definition of what a GIS is, it's a tool for making and using spatial information. At its heart, it's the where and the why. So where is something located on the earth or on another planet, and why is it located there? And so it's a tool for helping us understand, visualize, and start to answer those kinds of questions. One specific example of this that comes to mind for me really often is where are wild African elephant populations? How are these populations ranges changing? And honestly, is there any chance for us to save these wild African elephant populations? How about the same thing for polar bears or the Amazon rainforest or another endangered species that's on your mind? You know, GIS has been used and can be used to visualize and understand these kinds of complex dynamics on our planet. And I think for me, that's a really important use case of the tool that it is being used to help solve a wide range of these problems. A use case that comes really close to home for me was in New Orleans, Louisiana. And so in 2005, Hurricane Katrina came through New Orleans and caused over 1,800 deaths. And in the picture, you can see this um, X drawing that was placed on houses across the city as rescue teams and others went through the city, marking the date, who they were, and if they found any bodies or if they found any civilians inside of these homes. And some of the questions you can think of from a GIS aspect at least are, why did one neighborhood flood when others didn't? What was the neighborhood that flooded? And what were the, um, what were the ethnicities or what was the makeup of that neighborhood? And why was it that certain neighborhoods that were built in locations post-1900 were those that were predominantly more likely to flood? So in some of those examples, GIS is and can be used as that tool for making and using spatial information. And for me, the most important aspect of it is the fact that it's, it's a tool that can be used to take action. It's not something that's just passively creating maps. It's something that can let us actually get answers and do something. So with we've that talked a little bit about the definition of what a GIS is. And I want you to keep in mind the one dashboard that we've looked at already, that dashboard from Johns Hopkins University that I mentioned as a great example of a product that was created through the use of a GIS and is managed using a GIS. And so I think keep that in mind as we walk through this because these are some of the parts of a GIS.
The first component I wanted to mention is that of a geospatial cloud or the web. And there are a couple different components that can live in or exist as part of the web or cloud services. The first major component of a GIS is the software applications. So this is the way that users interact with maps, that analyze data, and create products like that dashboard that was built by Johns Hopkins. So you can think of the software and applications as those primary tools that users are using to build maps and also then interact with that, that data. The information products are the end result. So those would be the maps, the applications, the websites that users are, this is stupid. So we've already talked about what a GIS is. And so it makes sense to actually pull behind the scenes and see what the so we've already talked about what a GIS is. We've looked at a screenshot of the dashboard from Johns Hopkins. So you have an idea of the spatial aspect of it, the mapping component. But there's a lot of other pieces and parts behind the scenes. So one of the primary pieces to talk about and mention is this aspect of the cloud. And a term that we use sometimes is called the geospatial cloud, and really the web. You know, what is behind the scenes of the GIS that is helping broker and manage all of the information and all the applications and the data as well. And so as part of the cloud or as part of web services, there are the software and applications. Through this class, we'll be using ArcGIS Pro, we'll be using ArcGIS Online. There's a number of other open source applications out there as well, like QGIS which are those tools that users use to create maps, to analyze data, etc. On the information products, this is really more of the lightweight end result or the tools that are then provided to users that need to interact with and use the results of a GIS. So in the old days, this could be a paper map. And this could still be a paper map at times, but this could also be a mobile application. This could be a dashboard, similar to the dashboard we saw with the Johns Hopkins example. And then behind the scenes, there's obviously hardware that needs to support all of this. Hardware that could be a mobile device or a phone used to view this information, or desktop computers used to have the ArcGIS Pro software, or other desktop GIS software, and then hardware behind the scenes on servers in the cloud. One of the most important aspects of a GIS is the data. Again, if we think back to the Johns Hopkins example, that dashboard had data coming into it from multiple different sources. All of that data is hosted up in the web in either Amazon instances and Azure instances, and all of that information is then fed into that dashboard. And if that data was not of high quality, then the worth of that dashboard diminishes really, really quickly. People. So software and data is nothing without the people that are needed to interact with and use it and build out those end products. And here are a couple of the different individuals that get mentioned as part of the GIS ecosystem. The GIS professional, who's the user that's actually interacting with more of the core desktop software, the tools, to then build products and maps and applications for end users. And also behind the scenes, there need to be IT professionals and database administrators that can help manage the infrastructure that's required to support the GIS. So it's not just about sitting down and creating a map. It really requires all these different people working together to ensure that the end result is what's required and needed of all of these people. And part of that is really just the process. In a very simple way of describing this, the GIS professional or the end user can provide requirements and then they work iteratively to kind of define and build out a proof of concept or build out an application that might meet those needs. And then the GIS professional might need to go back to the IT staff to ensure that the right hardware and the right services are there to support that application. And then lastly, I just wanted to mention a couple of these key areas of GIS that are really, really important. Automation, 
application configuration, enterprise cloud, and requirements gathering. So we already talked a little bit about enterprise cloud, and the point here is just that behind the scenes, a lot of the information, the data, is not just sitting on a desktop computer. It's getting hosted and pulled from multiple different sources across the web. For automation, this could involve using Python or JavaScript or web services to ensure that data is not static and actually automate or script out a process to update data or applications. This is a growing skill and need in this field. Application configuration speaks to the need not to just build custom applications or maps, but actually have a simple and basic skill set where you can build out lightweight web applications to interact with maps and spatial information. Sometimes a user just might need to search for cities or search for population and have that displayed inside of a map. So the ability to configure and give that kind of simple application to users is really, really powerful. And then lastly, at the heart of all this is the skill to quickly understand and understand requirements for an application. So if a GIS professional or the IT professionals can sit down and say, you know, what are the specific needs you have? When does this need to be delivered by? And how quickly can I now return this kind of application back to you? Is a really, really strong skill set to have, especially with how quickly the software and the information space is moving. So we just talked about what the components of a GIS are. Now let's get take a step backward to some of the most critical aspects of what a GIS can do and what it is. And at its heart, a GIS is about layers. It's about taking different pieces of information and putting them on top of each other to get a better understanding either visually or through an analytical way of what is taking place and what the relationship between that data is. So here we're starting with just a reference layer. And many times this could be just called a base map. And this is a reference layer or a base map of Manhattan. And so we're seeing the streets, we're seeing water, we're seeing the general outlines of the landform there. And so now in the GIS, we can take additional data sets and additional information and start to drape them or drop them on top of this. So the first one I just added on is parks. So where are parks located throughout this area of New York? How about subway lines? So here are those colored lines moving throughout the city showing where subway lines are. How about farmers markets? How about poverty? And so you might already be thinking about it, but the ways that GIS can get used are not only starting to drape or layer and visualize this kinds of information on top of each other, but most importantly, it's starting to ask and then also use the software to analyze this information. Some of the questions I started to think about when I started to drape this information on top of each other is something as simple as, what is the relationship between the farmer's markets and the subway lines? Or more critically, what is the relationship between subway lines and poverty? Or what is the relationship between parks and poverty? Are there more parks in areas that are of more high affluence? Do those areas of high poverty, are they kind of pockets without access to as much transportation or as much access to the subway lines? So these are the kinds of questions we can visualize and also use the GIS to help us analyze. And it's not only those kinds of information, but I also added on a separate layer to the map. And this is a piece of information that would have been captured via remote sensing, either satellite or via an aircraft. And this is showing vegetation. And so rather than just drawing lines, points, or polygons onto a map, to display and analyze and view, you can also use photos or remotely sensed information. And in this case, this type of product is called an NDVI or a vegetation index. And those areas that are in the brighter green are really showing us where there's more moisture content. So you can see the rivers outlined, and then also it's picking up that moisture in leaf or canopy. And so that's why areas of grass or tree are popping out a little bit more. So you can start to understand what the health of vegetation is or where there is more vegetation 
or how vegetation has changed in certain areas. So we just looked at a couple different examples of data. So what are the key characteristics of data in a GIS? So first and foremost, GIS has information that's tied to a location or a set of locations. That's really the most critical aspect of a GIS. At its heart, GIS data in many times can just be tabular information with some simple attributes. But to be able to understand the relationships and visualize that information, it needs to have an XY a coordinate or an address or a way to tie that data to a location. And as I mentioned, that data many times is also combined with attribute data. So it doesn't just have the location or the XY coordinate and Z coordinate for the elevation tied to it, but it could also have any other information tied to it. Maybe the year it was built, or a year it was inspected, or you can think of a wide range of other attributes that could be tied to this. And then lastly, it can also have a temporal component or time-based component tied to the information as well. So how is data created for a GIS? And the two that I'm gonna mention in this slide is digitizing and georeferencing. And so in the video here, you saw an image, which would be captured via satellite or an aerial image that was flown over. And then here, we also have a map that is a historical map from 1950 that we're georeferencing. In both of these cases, what is being done is a digitization process to actually capture the outlines of the buildings in the current day in the imagery, and then also in that geo-referenced or that historical map. So here these yellow building outlines are basically just hand-drawn or hand-done outline sketches of where those buildings were in that historical image. And we're also then able to tie it to or place imagery underneath to compare today versus 1950. So how has this neighborhood or how has this place changed? And so by digitizing or literally just drawing in the outlines of those buildings and then also geo-referencing that historical map, we can start to do those kinds of compares and start to actually build out digital information that we can visualize and analyze. And as a reminder, geographic data is tied to a location or set of locations, as is the case here. It's often combined with attribute information. In this case, we're really just capturing the year that this information existed. So the yellow are buildings from 1950, the orange from today, and it often contains a temporal component, which similarly would probably be that year that this data was captured from. Vector versus raster. We've already seen some different examples of vector data and raster data, and I just want to make it clear what the difference is between these two. So data in a GIS is typically thought of as being captured in one of these two formats. Vector data is information that's shown on the left-hand side. And you can think of this as points, lines, and polygons. We're really capturing a point of a location, an XY coordinate, and that could be thought of as a vertice or a node. And so for these polygons, the computer is not storing the actual locations of all those lines. All it is really capturing if those areas are rectangles or squares is the vertices or the vertex, each of those corners, or another location where we need to drop another point to change the angle of that building. So the computer is just capturing the XY location of each of those points. Along with that, you can obviously store attributes as well. So we have the XY, the location, and then additional attributes that are getting captured for that data. And so points, lines, polygons, that kind of information is great for capturing data like shown here. Something very discrete, like buildings or rivers or lakes. In the right-hand side, this is raster information. And all this is showing you are pixels. And so for all intents and purposes, raster data is an image. And that raster information of those pixels are at a certain resolution. In this case, I zoomed in really, really far 
to just show the outlines of those specific pixels. But if we zoomed out a bit, you'd actually start to see that this is the same um, corner or outline of those buildings that are shown in the, the vector data on the left-hand side. But the raster data is just capturing the pixel value at these locations. And so in our vegetation index example, or if there's imagery, um, or if we're capturing infrared data, you can start to then use this information as the actual values of each of those pixels at a specific location. And so there's no attributes really tied to that raster data. It's really just the value that's captured inside that pixel. So where's information coming from? So data that's getting used in a GIS can come from a wide range of places. It could be tables or spreadsheets, data you could capture in the field, imagery, grids, GeoJSON or other web-based services, shape files and geodatabases, photographs. Even images captured on your iPhone are typically storing the metadata for that XY location. So you could pull those right into a GIS as well. IoT feeds, which are really talking about real-time information. So this could be stream gauges or traffic cameras or sensors, as well as augmented reality, 2D, 3D, there's a wide range of places that information can come from to be able to feed into and start using in a GIS. And then the last thing I wanted to cover in this um, lecture are some of the common functions for a GIS. And specifically, we're just gonna talk about symbology, queries, and joins. Symbology is the ability to change the color, the size, and the ways that information is displayed inside of the GIS. And in this example, we just have some locations of the stores of Burger Kings across the Northeast. And the important part of this that I wanted to drive home is that this is the same information getting displayed in both of these maps. We've just modified the symbology a bit. And the symbology could be changed to suit the needs of whoever is creating this map. Maybe the user of the map on the left-hand side is for Burger King PR, or they wanna show you know, how widespread Burger King locations are across the Northeast. And on the right-hand side, maybe this map was created by McDonald's, and they wanna show the opp opposite interpretation of that data. And this happens many, many times if you think of cell phone coverage and those types of battles between Verizon and um, Cricket or any of the AT&T or any of the other major carriers, where they use different types of symbology and visualizations to display their um, competitor in a different light. Data querying. So a GIS provides the ability to visualize information, but as we've already mentioned, the really the crux of GIS is about asking questions of your data. And in this example, I have some bullets on the slide like, hey, where are the parks? Which blocks have the highest poverty rates? Which houses were built before 1950? And in the, in the video, we're actually seeing how a user could use the GIS to go through and ask this kind of a question of the data. And in this case, we're using the select by attributes tool. So we're looking at the buildings data, gonna make a new selection, and we add a clause and we say, hey, where the year, which is one of the attributes, is equal to, and there's a range of other options, the year 1950. Then we hit apply, and all of the data that meets that query is selected. And behind the scenes, what a user is building out is actually a SQL query or an SQL query. Here showing the year equals the time timestamp of X. So these, the ability to do those types of attribute queries, and there's also the ability to do what's called a spatial query. In one example, a spatial query might involve something like the park shown here in yellow and these trees as the green dots. And a user just wants to ask the question, how many trees are within the park? So you can think back to our New York City data. If we had those outlines of Central Park and I also had points for all the trees throughout New York City, 
and I just want to get a count of how many trees are within Central Park, you could use this kind of a tool or this kind of an analysis to understand that total count or even take this a little bit further. In another example, these orange dots I'm thinking of as cities. And this red dot is a volcano. And what I want to know as a user is how many cities are within X distance of this volcano. And an, another use case that might be similar to this that is used all the time is how many people or population centers are within X distance of this chemical facility or this plant. And this could be downwind or a range of different ways to analyze and look at this information. And the last example, these are buildings. We've already looked at a couple examples of these. And here I have a floodplain. And so I want to know if I'm a member of a disaster management group or a local planning organization, what buildings or what houses or what people might intersect that floodplain. So I need to get a count of that, or I want to get an assessment of how many houses were actually flooded. So you can get that kind of result back based on a spatial query. So you can think of that as two different layers of information or multiple different layers of information, not just draped on top of each other for a visualization purpose, but to be able to actually get results and ask questions of that relationship. Another very common function of GIS is something called a join. And this is commonly done with database systems as well, but it's a very common function in GIS. And so you can think of these two tables as different features or different data that I have stored in the GIS. The one is parcels, which would be outlines of property records. And you can see the attributes here I have stored in that data set. And so I've got the object ID, I have a unique ID for the parcels, what year this parcel was you know, built, or maybe the year that the ownership changed. I have the address and square footage. And then I also have a separate table of owners. And this includes a parcel ID, the owner, and an object ID. And importantly, you can see that there are two different parcel ID columns in both of these data sets. And if I want to, I have the ability to join this information together. So I can actually create information based on those relationships. So let's say I wanted to select the parcels that were owned by Jonas Smith. I wouldn't be able to do that unless I created this kind of a join. And now I have parcels with owner as part of it. So I have a new data set that I can then use to make selections or visualize or conduct analyses based on that new column now being part of that data set. And this is really, really common because many times users do not want to store, you know, millions and millions of columns inside of one data set because it's just not, it's not feasible or it's not functional. And so the parcels might have a very small subset of data and then there could be multiple other data sets that could then be joined or related to that parcels data set when users need to. Based on, you can see here, this parcel ID could be a common or a key ID field. So I wanted to wrap up by coming back to the COVID-19 dashboard that was put together by Johns Hopkins. Because again, I think it is one of the best examples of what a GIS is and what it can be used for. And it really features a lot of the information and a lot of the methods that we showed um, throughout the slides previously. Thinking of the parts of a GIS or the concepts of layers in a GIS or some of the common functions. For example, let's say I just wanted to get a count of how many cases existed in the United States. This would be a great example of a query that I could do that would be a spatial query. So I could grab the outline of the United States and then select all those cases just within the United States or France or any other country and then get that result back. And also thinking of the parts of a GIS. Here, it takes a wide range of people, computing power and resources to clean up, stand up and make this kind of application available. So there's so much more going behind the scenes 
more so than just this flashy web front end. So in closing, and coming back to the learning objectives, you now understand what the parts of a GIS are. You can also understand the concept of layers in a GIS. And lastly, remember what the common functions of a GIS are as well. Well, thanks so much. I hope it was really helpful to be able to walk through that basic introduction to GIS, what it is, how it's changing, what some of the common functions and use cases are for the application. Thanks.